The animation does not depict the night lighting conditions that existed at the time of the accident. Certain system parameters or settings are shown, but these displays are not intended to mimic the actual displays in the cockpit. Selected comments from the CVR transcript attributed to the pilot in command, PIC, and second in command, SIC, appear as text at the time indicated in the transcript on the left side of the display area. Based on a review of previous takeoff attempts, the flight crew likely targeted an engine pressure ratio setting, or EPR, of 1.7, which is shown with a green horizontal bar. In addition, there are indications for activation of the auto throttle, flight power shutoff valve handle, or FPSOV, brakes, and thrust reversers. The animation is first shown at one-third speed and then plays again at actual speed. The animation begins as the airplane turns from the taxiway onto the runway. While taxiing onto the runway, the flight crew discuss the activation of the rudder limit light. These comments indicated that they had observed a blue rudder limit advisory message consistent with rudder movement with the gust lock still engaged. With the gust lock engaged, the throttle levers should have been restricted from providing an engine pressure ratio capable of enabling the airplane to reach takeoff speed. However, in this case, the gust lock system did not limit the motion of the throttle sufficiently to prevent an unsafe takeoff. The brakes were released and the throttles were advanced manually until they reached a restriction corresponding to an engine pressure ratio of about 1.4. This setting was substantially less than the normal target engine pressure ratio of 1.7 typically used by the pilots. The auto throttles were engaged and engine pressure ratios began to increase towards their maximum attained value of about 1.6 before reducing to about 1.5. As the engine pressure ratios reduced, the pilot in command commented couldn't get it manually any further, which suggests that he was aware of the restriction in the throttle lever movement. The second in command called out that the airplane had reached a speed of 80 knots. About six seconds later, the second in command indicated the airplane had reached takeoff decision speed. V1. The second in command then called rotate. One second later, the pilot in command said steer lock is on. The pilot in command repeated this statement six times during the next 12.7 seconds. About seven seconds after the rotate call, one of the pilots activated the flight power shutoff valve which removed the hydraulic pressure from the primary flight controls and ground spoilers, likely in an attempt to release the gust lock. About 11 seconds after the rotate call, brake pressure started to rise. This occurred at a ground speed of about 162 knots and with about 1,400 feet of runway remaining. Four seconds later, the throttle levers were pulled back and the pilot in command said, I can't stop it. The airplane exited the runway onto the paved overrun and the thrust reversers were deployed. The airplane exited the paved overrun onto the grass traveling about 105 knots. The sound of an impact was recorded about one second later at a ground speed of about 97 knots followed by the end of recorded data. The animation is shown again at actual speed with abbreviated comments. As the airplane taxied onto the runway, the flight crew discussed the blue rudder limit advisory message consistent with the gust lock still engaged. After the brakes were released, the throttles were advanced manually until they reached a restriction which corresponded to an engine pressure ratio of about 1.4. The auto throttles were engaged. The second in command called out that the airplane had reached a speed of 80 knots. The second in command stated the airplane had reached takeoff decision speed, 
v1. One of the pilots activated the flight power shutoff valve, likely in an attempt to release the gust lock. Brake pressure started to rise. The thrust reversers were deployed. The airplane collided with runway lighting and a localizer antenna and passed through the airport's perimeter fence before coming to rest in a ravine formed by the Shawsheen River. The main wreckage came to rest about 850 feet past the end of the paved runway overrun and was destroyed by a post-crash fire.